see at the bottom where it says words from Tadeum in the fourth century. The Tadeum is a standardized Latin text of praise to God. I don't think there's anything we would find in it unscriptural. It's just Latin. Um, there are other sources that uh, say this was either written by Ambrose, as in Saint, or Nicetus of Remisiana. You're like, well, how can we have this or stuff? Uh, yeah, haven't you ever had history people in front of you today? <laughs> yeah. There reaches a point where some of this stuff is just so old, we're making best guesstimations as, as to what we can do. And as, and as far as some of these other things are concerned, we get closer and closer and closer and closer to things. Um, one of the reasons that uh, almost Dr. Frazier and I have such an ongoing job in our life is we're not only practitioners, but we're scholars. Well, what does it take to be a scholar? You have to hold an opinion that's different than somebody else and try to prove it. <laughs> and then you try to do that, and they try to do this, and see, so you're both scholars. So it really doesn't matter which one is right. So that, that's, a, that's very much a part of our field. Um, but, if, you know, you heard her mention, you know, the literature. You know, everybody that does a dissertation, you have to read everything on the planet that's ever been written about that up to that point to even formulate your questions. And then there's a whole chapter in your dissertation where you have to present all of this uh, literature in various categories so that they, they, they think you're well-versed enough to, to, to be studying and speaking on this particular subject. So we, we joke around all the time with the current students that we have. I, don't, I, I have no earthly idea how some of them are going to go on to graduate school. <laughs> I, I love them and I mean that, but unless graduate schools change exponentially, you know, I couldn't Wikipedia or Google anything. <laughs> and, and there reached a point in, in, you know, when you have to go and take your orals and defend yourself, where anybody on your committee can ask you any question of the field, and they expect that information to just be up here. They expect you to just know it, not to say, oh, can I get back to you on that? <laughs> um, so, uh, oh, I loved that. I loved that. So, sometimes, all that fuses with the best guess. So, um, the next one definitely is from Ambrose, for sure. He studied literature, law, and rhetoric in Rome in the 300s. In 372, he was made governor of Milan, which at the time was the second capital of Italy. So, he has a political post, right? Yeah, that's what governor is. He has a political post. Then two years later, the bishop dies. Well, there's two groups of people that want someone to be bishop. And so as governor, Ambrose goes because he doesn't want a ruckus to break out. And he shows up. And the crowd pretty starts chanting, Bishop Ambrose! Bishop Ambrose! Because this whole other group of Arians they, they wanted their dude to be the next bishop. Well, Ambrose actually got elected. A, at this point, he had not been baptized. And B, he knew virtually nothing about theology. He was a politician. You can do with that whatever you want to. Uh, as far as him ascending to the bishopship of, of that with, with, with no theology. But anyway, he went and hid in, at a friend's house. And eventually his friend gave him up. And eventually he said, okay. And a week later he was baptized. Um, ordained. Duly consecrated. And immediately immediately adopted the ascetic lifestyle. Put a little nest egg over here for his sister. Gave all of his money to the poor. And that is traditionally what Ambrose is known for. Is, is caring for the poor and, and uh, 
just literally having virtually nothing on the planet. Uh, he was able to introduce popular reforms in worship uh, as well, and uh, is one of the most predominant, you know, early religious figures in, that have come down to us today. Because when I say Ambrose, most of the heads shake. When I say Nicetas, most people are like, what? What? Huh? Yeah. Uh, his biggest thing, as best as history can dictate to us, he is the one that coined the phrase, the communion of saints. We don't have it in any historical document before he presents it. And what he was meaning was when people do commune, the spirit of everybody present and the spirit of all those who have gone before somehow form that communion of saints with the presence of Christ. So, since that time, that phrase has been used fairly frequently. But he's the one kind of that initiated it. And maybe um, that's conceptually some of the things the Hebrew writer had in mind when he mentioned that we're surrounded by such a great plot of witnesses. This is just not a singular thing we are doing with our lives. There have been many other people that have done this with their lives. And we have a great and rich heritage, I believe. So, this was written around 380. That's pretty old, isn't it? 1771, we have the German version. We're going to see this a lot because as uh, Lutheranism and non-Catholic Christendom move through Western Europe, Germany is on the way to England. So a lot of things are going to happen in Germany first because of Luther and, and the Reformation um, that don't happen a little bit later in England. And then in 1853, it's translated into English, which is why we have this version of it here. Now, I think it's interesting. It is not identical, but it is similar. Um, to, to another hymn. And you can see at the bottom, it's tune named Grosse Gott, Wir loben dich. So clearly that comes from a German source um, and, and a German hymnal. But um, I guess we're going to see how many of you know some of the golden oldies that I grew up with. <laughs> because what I'm going to do is I'm going to take these words and I'm going to take When we get to the end, when we get to the second line and the end of the second measure, I'm going to hop down to the next to last measure of the third line, and I'm going to sing music that's almost identical in rhythm, but has these same pitches. Son of my soul, thou Savior dear. It is not night if thou be near. Oh, may no earth or cloud arise to hide thee from thy servant's eyes. That's the beginning and ending music to this. It's just, that sounds, this tune sounds an awful lot like that tune. It's just got some stuff in the middle of it. So, now, I've kind of given you a little bit of what this sounds like. We're going to sing this together. I also want to point out, uh, this is a term as um, hymn book editors making decisions. This is really going to sound caustic. And I really don't think I mean it to. <laughs> no, I really, I don't think I do. I don't think I do. 
But I, I'm just not totally convinced in my life that a hymnal is exclusively about creating a document for rich worship. How are all the costs of that printing going to get offset? What's always the American way? So, so. It has to make money. And some of these old hymns, the church was at a very different place because you'll notice in several of these, they don't shy away from the Trinity in any way, shape, or form. Third stanza, that's what it's all about. And then look at this. And adoring, bend the knee, bend the knee while we own the mystery. Ooh, I love that. But I'm not afraid of mystery in my relationship with Jesus. But there was a time where a lot of people were. Because the end of Holy, Holy, Holy originally was written, God in three persons, blessed Trinity. But there's apparently a time where that wasn't going to sell. Because we know God over all and blessed eternally. Because we don't want to talk about the Trinity. I can't make this stuff up. <laughs> this is the kind of stuff that really happens when people want to sell books. It really is. But these are still pretty tied to the original translation. And man, these mystics and old people had no trouble with mystery. No trouble at all. So that's why I find them rich and wonderful. So let's sing this together. God, holy God, we praise thy name.
is it has communicated to our young people <coughs> that church and the worship service is something that ought to be fought over. And that breaks my heart. Because they aren't old enough to totally understand sometimes the intensity, the intensity with, that we feel things or, or sometimes the fear we feel of, well, what if we head down this road and, and, and we don't know what's there and I'm sure of this thing over here. They're not used to sitting in Bible classes and talking about things like that yet. And so what we often do is when we take this away from them, where they would scratch their head, is we take a wonderful intergenerational talking point away from them. If they don't get it and you do, what a wonderful chance for you to talk to them. Not to scold them, not to lecture them, just to share with them about your faith, about how you can understand God, about why this text would mean something to you when they're just like, I, I need a dictionary to get through this thing. <laughs> and so I think um, we've largely done in the church what we've done in a lot of public schools, which is we've dumbed it down. And I don't think we're better for it. So just a personal opinion. Um, but I want to encourage those of us that are of this age it is so easy to love singing these old kinds of songs when we get together like this, and I do love it. I do love it. Um, but there will never, ever, ever be one service at the church where I attend where I lead songs where it's all just Devo songs. Won't be. That's not what they need. Even if they think that's what they want, it's not what they need. And... Uh, Man, I'm really bad to a lot of people because I'm not in favor of just flashing the words on the screen. Because if you don't know the song, you have no musical anything that will help you learn that. And you either sit there and mumble or you just don't participate. And you, you mark my words. Does God listen to the heart? Yes, I understand that. Don't get me wrong. But guess what, beloved? I am not God, and I'm stuck here on earth with you. <laughs> and I have ears, and I have training. You know, that, that old, that old uh, <laughs> poem goes, To dwell above with those we love, oh, that will be glory. But to dwell below with those we know, oh, that's another story. <laughs> you know, and, and I, I, I can't help that I have these things. And they walk into every church service, and my heart is sad when I can't hear good four-part singing. I can't help that. If I don't let it take me to the land of judgmental. I have no right to do that. It just makes me sad. And text only is not going to make that better. And you probably noticed, I mean, I don't mind the paperless hymn, though. I'll at least flash music up there. So that people can sometimes even find a version that has them. Shake notes! <laughs> Help us all out! Yeah! I get that. I get that. Um, but we get certain places and I think every I don't know how a Christian entity <coughs> wouldn't struggle with this. Isn't it so easy to make decisions out of fear? You're like, no, we would not do that. How many times have you heard, but if we do that, what will? And who is they? It doesn't matter what kind of Christian institution. Your college could do the same thing. Well, if we do that, there's certain wallets that might close up. What's that about? Well, people above me are going to say, that's not wisdom. <laughs> the peanut gallery is going to call it fear. Because <laughs> I just trust that God will provide. But let's make the right decisions for the right reasons and stop being so afraid. Amen. We serve a marvelous, wonderful God. Do we not think He can handle it? 
I believe that he can. So I'm ready for the church to make some decisions for the church based on the church and the people who will be visiting it from the community that are best for that. And isn't it interesting how how our, our, our mantra is, we have no headquarters. Each individual unit has autonomy until you start being weird to some other unit and we start getting all weird and hinky about the whole thing. <laughs> isn't that funny? Isn't that silly? What's that all about? It's about fear. It is about fear. And my text and your text. What casts out fear? Perfect love. Perfect love. If we anchor and ground ourselves in the crucified Christ and everything that he stands for, I think we're going to be fine. And I think that's what our youth need. Not to see the adults squabbling, but to see everybody agree on, we got to anchor in to this cross thing where we're toast. Mm -hmm. Because they won't find hypocrisy in that. And they might actually find something they can use in that. And I think some of these just help frame that in a different way um, than some of the music they so frequently have. All right. You didn't know you were getting all this, did you? Oh, uh, guess what? All right. Another one by Ambrose. So we don't have to worry about all the history. This was originally Splendor Pater Nagoria. <coughs> Written in about 374. Translated to English in 1899 by Robert Bridges. Um, and again, uh, yeah, there's the Trinity and the final stanza again. All right. This one even says Ambrose and Moron. Milan, Sermon. 
there's really not a lot of that in Scripture. Um, and how we are taking communion quiet. And oh my goodness, is there a worse 10 minutes for our children? <laughs> Isn't that interesting? Because if we're going to trace the etymology of communion back to the Exodus, cook a meal, tell the story. It's a family event. It's not a enter the private holy booth, just you and the big kahuna kind of thing that we have a tendency to make it. And I don't know what would happen if, if we made the word communion maybe more communal. I just know that we already have in place this singing thing. So I really don't care if you're one of those who would be like, oh, tell you what, Clark, you're like a carry a tune bucket. Let me hear that. Let me hear you not carry it. Don't sit there and not participate. It sends so many wrong signals to the youth on the importance you place in singing together. Maybe to some other people that this is something, it's a communal event. <clears throat> it's kind of like the, uh, the family get together. <clears throat> and sometimes I need to be reminded of things. Tell some people earlier. You, you don't know this about me because this is Teacher Clark. But as soon as I leave here and I can go to Clark Clark, <laughs> Clark Clark is an introvert. And whenever we're going to do something with a group of people, my wife will have to tell me, sweetheart, do not wind up over in the corner by yourself reading a book. This is family time. Be with the family. Now she knows she has to remind me of that because she knows better than anybody my inherent wiring. Why? Because she thinks that's wiring is wrong? No, but we don't get together anymore real often because of proximity. And when we do, what kind of message would it send if I acted like I wasn't participating? Could that possibly be misunderstood by some of the people I love and adore? And would they possibly do the wrong thing with that assumption? So I don't want us to do that with each other when we gather and sing on Sundays and Wednesdays. Sing. I don't care if you can't do it. Sing. Participate. Let your nature and your spirit join my <coughs> And join those around us and see if that doesn't make that communion of saints a richer thing for everybody. And it's more than just a preference, it's a command. Yeah. Yeah. So, man, I love this kind of stuff so much. To me, this keeps me tied to roots so that my tree can grow the way that it's supposed to. But if you ignore the roots, you ain't going to get the fruits. <laughs> I know that much. So anything that taps us back into our roots and, and, and who, we, who we are, who, who some people who worship God before us, how, how did they phrase things? I don't know the original Latin to know how close this even comes. There's a lot of trust that has to happen, isn't it? But we have this rich treasure trove that we're going to share with each other the rest of the uh, tomorrow, Friday. Uh, and We'll hear a little bit about some of these people and then do a lot of singing together. 
All right, I need to let you go. That's what the clock says.